Welcome to Stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. That's Briscoe, I'm Bradshaw. We have been trying to get some special guests on our show <laughs> all week long. We have been very unsuccessful, Jerry. I tell you what, John, I, I, I'm beginning to think it's the company that I'm keeping on this damn show, you know. Uh, JBL, you think everybody in the world, oh, JBL, oh, I know who he is, the longest reigning champion of all time, you know, and all that stuff. And, and you know, oh, he's a financial genius on Wall Street. Yeah, you're all that stuff. But when it comes to connections, when it comes to trying to get somebody to secure somebody on this show, you suck. <laughs> no, wait a we try, we, wait a we, minute. We, we're... I don't suck. Tim White's technology ethnic sucks. So we're Tim White, who is the legendary referee, one of our good friends, he was driving down to the great state of Texas. God bless Texas. And he stopped off in Lake Charles to join us on the show. And he couldn't figure out how to get into the Zoom call. So, and your buddy, Terry Funk, can't figure technology out enough <laughs> to get on the Zoom call either. So my problem is I got all you old guys on these shows they can't figure technology out. Well, you know, the common denominator, all that stuff. Number one, Terry Funk is a Texan. Number two, Timmy White is in Texas, headed to Texas, to Houston. So that, that's the common denominator. It's gotta be once you cross that Red River, Red River into the South, you know, all, all you guys' brain cells just leave you, you know, and, and that's a shame, Timmy White. Timmy White, I know what Timmy White's gone through. You know, John, with, with my, my neck, I just got out of my neck break from that damn uh, uh, Mick Foley and Randy Orton attacking me. You know, I spent a couple of nights in the hospital. So I just got out of my neck brace. But Terry Funk, I, I, I talked to Terry. Terry called me, saw me with a neck break. He was concerned, you know, but I, I, I talked to Terry just about weekly, you know, and he, uh, he, 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 he ready to come on the show but it's the same thing i said terry do you do you know what internet is and he said well i got a telephone i said terry you got a laptop and he said my wife had one it's somewhere around the house but i hadn't that hadn't been turned on and i said so you don't know what the internet is you don't have a, well i used to have one you still paying the bill for internet i don't know and i said so uh, terry I, Funk never goes on the internet he don't go on, he don't, he don't, all he can do, he, he goes on the telephone and he, he don't even text message with you. You can't text message with Terry Funk. You know, you got to, if, if he wants to answer the phone and it's bad, and he even told me this, he said, I love this caller ID because I don't have to answer calls that I don't want to answer. He wouldn't answer my phone call, John, for so long because I had a 203 area code. <laughs> He was scared, and for those that don't know, that's Stanford, Connecticut, which is the home of WWE. So he's scared somebody from the office is calling him. You know, Terry Funk and I, we tag team one time in WWE, and we almost got into a fist fight, a legitimate fist fight at six o'clock in the morning because we're returning the rental car, and you know, you're splitting trance or splitting the gas money, splitting you know, stuff like that. I topped off the car, the rental car. And he got out of the car mad. And I thought we were gonna get in a fight at six o'clock in the morning because I had topped off the rental car. Tell me about what a waste of money that was. I'm like, Terry, it's 25 cents, your share. I'll pay it. That's not the point, kid. And he's trying to teach me a lesson, which to this day, I've never learned. Well, you know, I was always Terry Funk. He was always trying to teach you and to teach you things in the ring and teach you things in life, John. And you should listen to him. I mean, and, and now there's laws against topping off gas tanks. You go to California and you tell them, top, they won't top off your gas tank. So look how far Terry Funk was ahead of his time. Yeah, that's the only thing Terry Funk's ahead of his time on. Hey, you worked with Terry Funk in Japan, didn't you? Yeah, I, I got a great story with Terry Funk. I spent, you know, back in our days when we went to Japan, it wasn't any of these little quick in and out things. You know, you were stuck there and you were, you you were like a you were a, you were like a, just whatever they wanted you to do when they yeah, they wanted you to do it you were obligated to do it because they were paying you such great money but I had a great uh, fortune of of least being over there with a uh, with an awesome crew and you know yourself how important a 
crew is when you go away for it, no matter what country you go to for no matter what length of time it is. It's always the crew that 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 makes the trip, right? Yep. Yes. I thought you'd gone to sleep on me there for a no, second. No, I'm going to sleep on you. I'm listening to your story. Okay, well, listen to you. I'm telling you a story about Terry Funk in Japan. So I, I had the great pleasure. At least I had Terry Funk on this. I gave a four week tour that I had to go to on Japan. So in, in that four weeks, you know, you, you, you hit those islands, you hit all the you know, North Islands, South Islands, and uh, all the islands in between. Well, this particular day, we left Tokyo Harbor and we're going over to some uh, island that has a, a, a volcano that smokes all the time. It don't shoot the lava, but it damn thing smokes all the time. They have minor earthquakes there all the time. So, you know, it's a little spooky looking. You know, you look back in those Orson Welles movies or uh, George Carlin movies, whoever the hell they are. I think it's George Carlin, but you look back at his stuff. Uh, and there are little spooky volcano scenes. But uh, me and Funk, we take that boat over. Before we left City Harbor, I think Funk had counted two dead bodies that he saw in City Harbor floating in a, in a, in a, in a, in a harbor there. Was that normal? And we get out to sea. And they weren't really bodies, uh, John. It, Terry Funk and vivid imagination, you know. <laughs> and it might have been enhanced by a little sake or something like that. <laughs> So when we we were we sail most of the day, we get into this island just right, you know, right before it, it it's summertime, so the days are long over there. So we get in there, you know, in mid-afternoon. We still got a lot of time to kill. And the show is not until the next afternoon. We're doing two shows in this town. We're doing a but not that night. We're doing a matinee show, then we're doing an evening show. It's a fishing village and uh they have different ships that come in for the, for the shows there. So uh, Terry Funk and I, we know we got all day and all night to kill. So we, we uh, the harbor to the hotel, maybe two or three blocks and that's it. So we start walking, walking, walking. Terry Funk and I are walking together and all of a sudden Terry looks over and he sees a junkyard. He said, Briscoe, you had Briscoe brothers, you know about junkyard. He said, uh, about that time a motorcycle goes by, a kid on a motorcycle, he said, let's go in that junkyard and let's see if we can find a couple of motorcycles and put them together again. Cause Terry pr pretty uh, mechanically minded. He can, he can do a, a couple of things with the, with, the, with the engine. I said, okay, let's take a look in there. You know, I'm a body man, you're, you're, you're a starter man. So we go in, we have Joe Haguchi. Was you, you uh, old enough to remember Joe? No, I remember Joe, yes. Joe, great guy, you know, he's the, he's the uh, translator for us, you know. Yeah. And so, come on, Joe, we want to buy a motorcycle. So we go in there, we see this big old pile of junk motorcycles. So we're thinking, you know, if we take two or three of those, maybe we can make one or two. So we start messing with Joe, we tell Joe to make a deal. So we, we pay the guy like 50 yen a piece, which, you know, 20, 30 bucks, whatever it was at the time, it don't matter. But so, we start horsing around and we actually get one started and, but it's one of their little bitty scooter type motorcycle. So, so finally uh, we mess around, we get a second one started. Now, neither one of these things have mufflers. So as I stated, this is a damn fishing uh, village. So we go back to the hotel, we have a couple of drinks, we get a little bored and it's a little island with a big volcano in the middle of, but it's got, they tell us that you go out at night, watch out, these roads dead in and there's caves out there and there's all kinds of creatures in those caves that you don't want to be messing with, you know, so, okay. So uh, we have dinner and we uh, mess around. We have a few drinks and Terry said, Briscoe, let's go for a ride on a motorcycle, so. It's a little fishing village, and like I said, it's late afternoon now, it's evening, and so everybody's the sun's just going down. So we get out on a motorcycle, and all of a sudden, they come to a dead end of the damn place, the little island in Japan. They look down at the damn cliff. So holy shit, Terry, we gotta be careful. So like I said, these things, so we just turn around, go back through town and go through the other side. By now, by now that sun is down and it's dark out there. And all we got is these little lights on there. Like I said, we got no muffler. So we're going through downtown in a little fishing village and we're waking all these fishermen to go uh, 
up and go to sleep at uh, you know sunset and they're up before daylight to get their fishing boat ready and go fishing. So we hit the other side of the island. Same thing, we run out of space. By that time, we start turning around going back into town and we see two red lights coming towards us. Oh no, it's a damn Japanese police. They're coming to take our motorcycles away from us. And they got Joe Haguchi in the back seat with them. <laughs> and I look at Terry, I said, man, you got us in trouble this time. There's a, there's a picture of me and Terry sitting, uh, standing on the, on the beach side there in, in uh, Tokyo. And it's, it's, it's waiting that we, we pulled the things over we're waiting for the cops and to, or Joe Aguchi to explain to the cop what we're doing out late at night waking everybody up in this fishing village. So Joe says, okay guys, you know, just forget it. You know, I took care of the cops. You guys parked the motorcycles and you know, forget it and let's all go to bed, you know, and hell it's still nine o'clock. So we go back to the hotel and we drink some more. So that's my Japanese story. So the next day <laughs> we get up, we, we do our two two shows. Everybody jumps in that bus, you know, everybody, they got their big bus and all the guy jean guys, because the American guys pile into it and you go to the venue. So we said, you guys go in, we'll get on our motorcycles and just ride behind us. So we're riding in, as you know, John, there's always a festival of going on there in these Japan places. And people are on both sides of the street, the bus going by their chair, and Terry and I going by on our motorcycle their chair because Terry, you know, being a being Terry Funk, you know, so we make it to the venue, and then that we would do that that afternoon show. So we ride our bikes back to the hotel. We're good boys because we're tired. And we got to go again. So we go again once again. I mean, by the time we have that evening show, the evening show's over. Fishing Village is asleep again. We get on our motorcycle and we crank them up and. Boy, here, here comes Joe Coochie. Hey, guys, please. So we go back to the hotel tonight. We're good boys. So Terry and I go to our room to go to the bar first, and we start planning. What are we going to do with these motorcycles we, we spent uh, this money and time for? I uh, said, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Tomorrow when we're riding riding down to the um, to the dock, I'm, I'm going to find me a little kid. And I'm gonna go give a present old to to a little kid, be a baby face. Terry said, "Oh, he damn baby fat, typical shit." He said, "I'm gonna ride mine right into the damn ocean, roll off of it right before it gets to the edge of the cliff." Uh, you're a crazy ass. I don't think you'll do that. And he said, "I watched me." So the next day we take off, and we're headed down to the boat. And I see this nice little family there. I pull over the side, it's right by the boat. And I pull over the side and I said, here, present to, you know, give them, give them a motorcycle or the keys, whatever I did there. But I give it to them and I said, thank you, Baba. <coughs> Excuse me. So I turn and I look at Terry and Terry Center revving up that, that little, little moped bike. He, and he takes off, zoom, he takes off right before it gets to the edge of the dock. Terry rolls off. Terry starts rolling and, and it, it's, it's gravel. And so by the time I, you know, I'm looking at it, it don't look pretty good. The bike, it took a couple of tumbles and it missed the end of the dock about 10 foot. So he did it. He got up and he bleeding from head to foot from all that gravel in there. So that's just a crazy story how we passed time in Japan. <laughs> that is insane, Jerry. Absolutely <laughs> insane. So you're waking up the entire, you're terrorizing this Japanese fishing village every night with these no muffler motorcycles. Yeah, and uh, Joe Aguchi was not happy. Neither was Giant Bubba. He wouldn't talk to us on that whole boat trip back to Tokyo. But He was mad about terrible. the motorcycles? Hey, I would, Terry was pissed off about it. He, yeah, we, yeah, he was really pissed off about the motorcycle, but he was more pissed off about Terry trying uh, getting all cut up, you know, uh, trying to do the little stomp with the motorcycle going in uh, and the Sea of Japan or whatever the hell that thing was. We used to, you know, you take those buses and they had the uh, VCRs and uh, Stan Hansen always sat in the back of the bus. So Stan was notorious. If he didn't like the movie, he would get up, take it out, eject it, and throw it out the window. And just go and sit down. I saw him do it one time. It was awesome. Like everybody's like, okay, now we got nothing to do. <laughs> but it was Stan. You go, what are you gonna say? Everybody loves Stan, but you couldn't beat him up anyway. 
<laughs> yeah, what are you going to do? Stay in Hanson's old movie out the window? Stan told the me one time there. he dropped a knee off the top rope on a guy and he potatoed the guy. The guy said, Stan, what the hell was that? Stan said, well, I got up there and I realized I didn't know what I was doing. So I thought, I'm either going to hurt myself or I'm going to hurt him. And you saw which one I chose. <laughs> and that was Stan's, that was Stan's explanation for it. We can stand on here. He knows technology. So Tim White, Tim White, who tried to uh, come on the show, he had what I believe is the biggest scandal, and that includes your Montreal screw job, and that is the liquor basket that he and Arnie would sell every single year. So every year, Arnie and Tim would put together this liquor basket, and guys would buy tickets for it, you know, buy like $5, $10 worth of tickets. Every year we found out that either Tim, Tim's or, or Arnie's or Arnie or Arnie's son would win the liquor basket. So finally, we're in Scotland. We're driving up in the northern Scotland, all around the place. Timmy's having a few drinks, and he says something about the Loch Ness monster. He goes, "You know that Loch Ness monster is as big a scam as that liquor basket I sell every year." <laughs> I didn't realize what he said. <laughs> and so I go, "What? What'd you say?" <laughs> And if he were here, he could answer to that. He says he's suing me over breaking up the uh, liquor basket scam he had, the extortion racket. I I, I contributed to that liquor, liquor basket. I don't know how many years. And when, when you guys discovered that, when you guys got back from Scotland and told me that, I mean, poor Timmy White. I mean, Timmy White, poor Timmy. Well, Timmy White, uh, him, and, and, him and Arnold, and it was even passed down to a second generation, John. That's an amazing thing. That's an amazing. A scam usually lasts just one generation or just for a little while. This thing went on continuously, and I I was like everybody else. I would be get me a damn big old Roco that's good old Timmy White. You know? That's right, yeah. yeah. Tim's God. coming to this great old referee, friends with Arnie Scollin, who everybody loved. Now everybody loved Timmy too. And yeah, and friends, friends with Scollin. Friends yeah, with Brad friends Scullin with, was such a good guy. Friends with Andre. I mean, everybody loved Andre. So Tim would come around with this liquor basket, and you're going, "Oh man, this is Tim White." Uh -huh. Yeah, give me. And he'd give you a draw. And here's the thing: he'd give you a draw, and then he'd ask you if you want to buy a liquor basket tickets. So now you're sitting there with cash. And you're like, okay, yeah. And you'd give him like a ton of money. And then we found out it was a scam. And then after we found out it was a scam, he still sold tickets <laughs> after we knew it was a scam. And we still asked him every year, where, where's the liquor basket? We you still know? gave him money for the liquor basket. Yeah, even though we, it we wasn't knew there. it was a scam. <laughs> it was good old Timmy White. But, you know, Timmy, I can emphasize with you all on the damn uh, technology. Those are watching my Briscoe's big announcement. You know, I I got I, I always have trouble with, with technology. So, you know, I am through friends like uh, John and even uh, even uh, that fat guy uh, uh, that we talk about all the time. Uh, and oh, and another friend, Taylor Williamson. You guys have helped me through, and all all of our friends out there in the internet world has helped me with my cellular iPhone and helped me learn how to do that. So, Timmy. If you just get on and share some of your stories, you'll blow up just like John Layfield. <laughs> That's the end. You know, I'm beginning to believe that there's no big announcement. There's not a big announcement. This is a scam like the liquor basket. John, I know. I wouldn't go through all the pain and, and the hospital bills that I've accrued doing this thing. I mean, it's just gotten unbelievable. Believable, you know me. I'm on a first name basis down at St. Joe Hospital North, down down the road here, about ten miles down the road. That's the closest medical facility that I have, and I'm an old man. And why these guys want to keep picking on me, I don't know. I'm a nice guy, you know that. <laughs> Compared to who? <laughs> uh, well, hey, pick your pick your pick your poison, I guess, but. <laughs> John, you you and Eddie Guerrero had some of the most violent matches ever in the history of, of, of WWE, WWF. A couple of times, uh, people know that they have a real uh, easy, uh, easy uh, 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 digestive system, and, and, I, and I throw up fairly easy, regurgitate fairly easy, but 
some of those matches that you had, I mean, not only were they just brilliant with Eddie Guerrero and t told such a magnificent story, but they were any you know, 50 over 50 some odd years in business to even to this day, to me, they were some of the most brutal matches I ever witnessed in, in my life. I mean, and Eddie was such a competitive person and just as you were, and that what must have really sparked that match. I mean, tell me a little bit of the ingredients of it and just tell me uh, your thoughts on working with Eddie. Yeah, you know, the Staples Center was the one that was so bloody and that was really a one-off. We didn't know if we we're gonna come back in, in a rematch or not. We had no idea, you know, because the JBL character was either gonna work or not work. And if it didn't work that night, it was that was it pretty much for the JBL character. Eddie knew that as well. And Eddie wanted the JBL character to work so badly that he wanted that match to be a success. I and mean, he, he used to call me with all types of ideas, all types of promos. He's the one that came up with the heart attack angle on his mother on Mother's Day. Oh, down in El go, go into that. Uh, just, just take you back. This is probably one of the most emotional uh, nights in, in the history of WWE. Now we're in El Paso, Texas, the home of the Guerreros, the most famous wrestling family ever in Southwest uh, Texas there, and perhaps the entire te Texas, the state of Texas, and that includes the Von Erich. But the Guerreros, they were known at every corner of the world, and it was because of this. And John does this horrific angle with Eddie Guerrero's mother in El Paso, Texas. The, the grapefruits you had to have that night, John, were just amazing. It was unreal, Jerry. I, yeah, it, it was the white heat. You know, guys, old guys talk about white heat. And there's probably 10,000 people there. And they were all there to see Eddie Guerrero and pay homage to Gory Guerrero, who they were paying tribute to that night. It was Mother's Day weekend. And Eddie was going to give flowers and a presentation that the arena was chanting, Gory, Gory for Gory Guerrero. So Eddie gives flowers to his mother. And when she, when he does, we've already had our match. Eddie went over and he retained the championship. We're building up for the Staples Center coming up in a few weeks. I come back down to the ring and I hit Eddie over the head with a chair. And when I did, I caught him with the edge of the chair and I busted him open. So blood's coming down his face, which added to the effect. That certainly wasn't planned, but it added to the effect. Eddie goes down. I turn to the mother who's, I think, 74 years old at the time. And I'll look at her like that. And when I do, she grabs the hand. Well, it looks like I'm choking her, but she's guiding herself down is what she's doing. Now, I am two or three feet. I'm arm's length from her as she goes down. It looks to me like she's had a heart attack. I'm going, this is the most working person I've ever seen in my life because this is, she looks like she just died. And I'm like, oh, my God. And the, the Eddie's uh, wife, Vicky, and his daughter start, they're screaming and sobbing at ringside. Literally, people think I've just given this 70 year old woman on Mother's Day weekend, honoring her late uh, husband, a heart attack. Eddie's down bleeding. The mother's down now. I'm staying in the ring and you could hear a pin drop. There's 10,000 people there and you not a person saying a word. And Eddie looks up and he goes, Essay, you better get the fuck out of here. They're going to kill you. <laughs> And, and I'm sitting there, and I, you know, the last thing you're going to do in a ride is turn your back. I've been in a couple of rides. You know, you don't turn your back. So I'm thinking, this is on camera. They don't know we're filming it. We're filming it like it's from security cameras, so make it look real. And I'm sitting there, and I'm yelling at Eddie. I'm yelling at the mother. The state troopers who we got around ringside, Bruce Pritchard was there. He was the one had all the state troopers around ringside. They're going, John, get out of the ring. They're going to riot. They're going to riot. I'm thinking, this is the greatest film ever. I'm not rushing nothing. And I'm sitting there, I'm yelling at the crowd, I'm yelling at Eddie, I'm yelling at the mother on the ground that I'm praying is okay. <laughs> I'm yelling at Eddie Guerrero. I get back to the back and the place now is starting to rumble. And I mean rumble. They, they are getting, they are about to storm the back is what they're about to do. The police have my car uh, right outside. My bag's in the back. The car is running. And I get in the car in my 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 home wrestling gear and drive out of town and the police tell me said don't come back we cannot guarantee your safety we think somebody will kill you it was that much heat it was unbelievable I, when i get out i get to like the interstate i got to drive all the way to odessa i had to stay in odessa i went back to el paso years later 
and I go in a gym and people are just eyeballing me. And I'm thinking <laughs> I could get stabbed before I get out of here. There was, it was heat like you wouldn't believe the, during that time. All leading up to the uh, Staples Center. And after that, Jerry, as you know, everywhere I went, you had to have extra security. There were jumpers in the rings. We were in Southwest there. We were in Southwest uh, United States, which is mainly his, with a huge Hispanic population. Man, when you show up, it'd be 99% Hispanic and they all want to see me die. <laughs> it was, uh, it was unbelievable. We had such a good time with that. We go to Staples Center, end up setting an attendance record. You know, we were worried we couldn't even sell tickets. You know, JBL, this unproven character and Eddie Guerrero, who was the, you know, a proven character, but he's just opponent that they didn't know if could draw or not. And uh, fortunately that angle drew and it was all thanks to Eddie. Well, it, it, it was just so phenomenal. But I mean, people that never experienced that white heat, I mean, uh, do yourself a favor and go on and do a little Google research and, and watch some of these old time matches. I mean, uh, you know, like uh, the old time hill, like Killer Carl Cox, you know, that can get heat on a dime. You know, I mean, uh, guys, the old master that's buttoning on rows, any of these old guys that, that get and listen to the story about the white heat, it what the heat gets so hot in there that, like you said in your description, you could hear a damn pan drop. It's the most. And you know, at any world. time, your life's in danger. <laughs> oh, I only had it uh, probably two or three times in my career. That was by far the biggest. But that yeah. white heat, when it gets quiet, you've been in the ring when you've seen it. It, 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 it it's inexplicable. You know that you are in danger. <laughs> you know yeah. that you know something's crazy about to happen. But you love it. I mean, it's just it's, you, you just you live for that. I mean, that's a feel oh. as a feel, and even as a baby face that you work for, you get you know people say you work for a pop. You know, pop you dive over the rope and get caught, and that's your pop. You know, they don't understand what what that white heat is. You know, and but John, leave it even leading up to that, you've done some of the most controversial, politically incorrect promos that nowadays yeah. they would they would have what's that thing trump usually get put up on the bottom of this and not uh ver uh, verified not verified yeah, yeah but it it's on the promos you did out in the desert looking for uh oh my goodness you couldn't do that now girl family i mean tell us about that you know the thing was eddie and i both grew up in west texas so i grew up i grew up i worked on a ranch when i was in west texas i worked with a couple of legals that were there so i have a different viewpoint of you know illegal immigration than most people because i grew up working with uh, these people they were politics aside i mean they'd been there for 25 years in the community they were part of the community there's part of america i don't care what your political ideology is but those guys were the only thing that about them that was uh, you might say was different was the fact that they weren't uh, registered citizens of the country. So I knew how the prejudice in that area worked. You know, I, I could see these guys, you know, they were all rich and would throw money in people's faces and they talked down about everybody, talked down about uh, Mexicans and talked down about immigrants, talked down about other races, you know. And so I knew what worked because I didn't, I hated that. I thought that I hated those guys. But I thought if that made me hate them, and I was from that area, think about how it makes somebody else hate these guys, or hate me, JBL, I did not understand. being from that area. And so that's where the, the a lot of the basis of some of these promos were from. And, and Eddie was so instrumental in that. Eddie used to call me all the time and go, hey, try this promo. And it was always an anti-immigrant or anti-Mexican promo. You know, Eddie understood where his popularity came from and where my heat came from. And he was so good about it. It was really a collaborative effort between Eddie and I putting all those promos together. I don't think you could do it today, but man, when we did it then, it was, it was real, real freaking heat. You know, these guys talk about heat today. They, they ain't seen nothing from what real heat is. It was real heat. It was that knife cutting heat, you know, and I, uh, you know, like I said, do, do yourself a favor and, and watch some of these old time ideals. But Eddie, Eddie, I mean, through his family, you go back and, and you see some of the, some of the greatest all time baby faces in our business were from that Hispanic bloodline, oh, from that Mexican, from that Gory Guerrero and Ricky Romero uh, bloodline out in Texas out there. They train these Mexican guys and they would have some of the most fiery comebacks that you ever seen and could sell 
could sell where you you know you got the feeling you just look out and you're looking at that audience and you know just another inch more that they would be coming in that ring after you. That's how great some of these uh Annika performers you know Eddie like. Eddie if you ask Eddie say Eddie put together a match in the back he couldn't put together a match for save his life. Uh, not that he wasn't smart. He's a very smart guy. He was obviously a great wrestler. It was all field to him, every bit of it. But when he went out there, he would call backdrops on the tables. He'd call stuff. It, the stuff he was, the stuff we did was called on the fly. A lot of it by Eddie. I mean, he he was like grabbing a live wire that wasn't grounded. It was like this sudden burst of electricity being in the ring with Eddie Guerrero. It was unreal. And like you say, he would sell like he was dying. And then when he started coming back, he'd just be slow, 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 slow. I remember one time we followed The Undertaker, uh, and we're last match because either I had the title or Eddie had the title. And Taker put on this freaking clinic, man. You, you know how it is when follow yeah. that. <laughs> so he put on this match that was just freaking a match. One of the greatest challenges in the business, isn't it? Follow that. <laughs> oh, my God. So <laughs> – we used to always joke, you want to follow uh, you want to follow the killer, you better get a pine box. Oh, <laughs> oh Jerry Lee Lewis. Uh, so we go out. I'm looking there watching this match, and I go, Eddie, hey, man, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Are we, I, I'm thinking, I can't follow this. I can't, I, I can't follow this. This is freaking phenomenal. So we get in the ring. I get Eddie in the headlock, and I call a favorite spot we had. Tackle drop down, double arm drag, go outside the ring. He says, no, no, sit here. I said, okay. So I said, I said, all right, tackle drop down, double arm drag, go outside the ring. He goes, nope, sit here. And I thought, what are you doing? And the crowd's all at a fever pitch from Undertaker. Finally, the crowd starts coming down. The crowd kind of gets dis disinterested. Then the crowd kind of gets bored. And I realized what Eddie's doing. He's bringing them down. Bring them down to bring them right back up. And the minute we started, we started from a lower base. And we, man, by the end, the people were all on their feet. Everybody was excited at the end. And I told Eddie, I said, that was masterful. That was like being out there with Mozart, man. That was freaking unbelievable. But few guys are like Eddie who would have the confidence and who would have the knowledge to be able to go out there and go, you know what? I'm going to bring them down. I'm going to bore them. And then for 30 minutes, I'm going to get them back on their feet. And you know, that's, that's that old school stuff that you just learn or, or some people never learn, but Eddie sure knew it. Eddie knew it. And I think, you know, you, you're exactly right. You think back at that old Johnny Valentine, you know, Pat O'Connor, some of those old greats like that, that could just sell and sell and just, just tell you a story and then just get the people right in the, right in the palm of their hand. And then, uh, then when it was time to blow, I mean, and that, that's the thing about Eddie too. When you beat him down and you beat him down and you beat him down some more on his insistence. That's right. That, that guy was ready to go. You, you just stood back and let him do whatever the heck he wanted to do because he treated you so fairly and yep. he wanted to make sure that you returned the favor and you did every damn bump that was humanly possible in your body for that man because of what he had done for you. Yep. I used to, I used to try to take some type of quick breather, you know, cause we had to go, you know, a lot of times 25 to 45 minutes, especially in house shows. And I try to take some type of quick breather right before the comeback because Eddie was so giving that I wanted to be able to be there for everything. And then, man, it was a, it was a cardio nightmare being out there for his comeback. Cause you had to feed here, feed there, feed there. And Eddie, Eddie's calling stuff on the fly. And you got to be here, there, bump, 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 bump. It was insane. But y'all, you're right. You wanted to be there for him because he was there for you. Well, what do you think? <laughs> well, we didn't have Tim Wyatt, but we had some great stories. <laughs> <laughs>